Hell freezes over, freezing limbo modules to reduce Inferno's memory footprint. A bit about me, I'm a physics graduate, not a computer science graduate. Uh, this means that I probably do a lot of things which are a bit different to other people and I tend to look at things a bit differently. I'm currently a technical writer or developer at different times and my interest in Inferno is mostly well, at least to start with, from his from an historical perspective, I was intrigued when I first discovered Inferno and Plan Nine, and I thought it was interesting that Inferno was a, a system that was somewhat complete and self-contained, and felt that it had been a bit forgotten. And then I wanted to try using something other than Linux, which I was using at the time. And these days I'm now mostly trying to port Inferno to different devices just to see what I can do with it on those things and just out of interest really. So some context for this presentation. I'm talking mostly about small devices really. Devices with a bit of flash memory, not very much RAM. So examples of these are the STM32 F405 which is an ARM Cortex M4 core device, a microcontroller, which has just 192 kilobytes of RAM and a megabyte of flash. Uh, another one which is also interesting in some ways is the RP2040, which um, has it's a different Cortex, ARM Cortex core, and has a bit more RAM. But these things are aimed at kind of different markets I think. But one thing they both have in common is that they both use the same instruction set which is a sort of a you could say a cut down or embedded instruction set which is aimed at sort of denser code. And I'm using the STM32 microcontroller in this sort of project. But if you're interested in running Inferno on the RP2040, then there is a port of Inferno you can take a look at. So building Inferno on an STM32 device, we can use the, an existing tool chain, um, which was written for handling thumb instructions. And this is based on what on the ARM tool chain, except for the fact that the compiler is TC and the linker is TL, but they both use the same assembler. And they have some options which are specific to thumb instructions, but it's pretty much the same sort of thing as running the ARM compilers. And if you're interested in messing around with these tool chains, I wrote a couple of articles about using them to create bare metal code for, for thumb sort of devices. But some problems that we have when doing things with devices like this is that they don't really have a lot of RAM and so if you're looking to port Inferno to them you need to bear in mind some things and two of the things that stand out is a lot of data is copied into RAM when you when you're running Inferno on these and this tends to be the result of how Inferno is bootstrapped. Um, I think a lot of the devices I've looked at, generally the system, the kernel, the root file system, other things are all wrapped up together in some kind of storage. It could be flash storage, it could be some kind of external storage. And then they're copied into RAM and, and run. And this is a bit of a problem when you don't have a lot of RAM to start with. And another issue is once you get something working, loading a limbo module has an overhead in terms of memory allocation. So the thoughts are when you consider this, what, what can we do about these issues? Well, the first one we can't really immediately do anything about. 
you could modify the compiler and linker to do things differently with respect to where the code lives, where the data lives. Or you could use a custom allocator, which has been done before, to make sure that you're not allocating so much memory when you, you're, you're doing sort of common things in, in, in the kernel and in other core functions. But looking beyond that, the, the second issue it could be worth exploring um, if you can reduce the overhead from, for loading limbo modules you might be able to squeeze a, a, a an interesting system into into the, um, the memory available so looking at limbo modules to try and approach this they're compiled to or they, they compile into sort of disk disk files which contain a number of features. So for example, there's like a magic number at the start of the file, some code, some bytecode, or at least encoded bytecode. There's information about types, data, and some other things that relate one module to others. And this is described in the in the man page for the for the file format, which also goes into more details about certain things. And when limbo modules are loaded to be run, a number of things happen. So for example, in the libinterp lib directory, there's a file called readmod, which covers some of this. And there's a readmod function in there. What this does is it allocates RAM for the contents of a disk file that wants to be needs to be loaded, and then it kind of then it calls parse mod in in the load.c file, which actually performs the decoding of each section of the file, and this involves allocating RAM for data structures that are going to be kept around so that the module can be run and and it can be used by other modules and so on. And then finally, the RAM containing the, the original file data from the disk file is freed. And what you end up with is a module struct with some pointers to allocated memory for each of these decoded sections. So looking at a code section, what's interesting about it is it's just instructions. If you run disk dump on a, on a disk file. It shows you the instructions. They're just assembly instructions. They're, they don't do anything strange, like self-modify them, themselves. The, the code isn't self-modifying. So the question immediately arises, can, you know, why not move them into flash memory, where since they're not changed after they've been loaded, why have them in RAM? So decoding the disk file expands the instructions. This is one reason why you can't just move them into flash memory. To get around this, we would need to expand them at kernel compile time. If we were going to put them in flash, leave them in flash, they would need to be expanded. And so what we could do is compile them into the kernel as some kind of read-only data. In a sense, we can freeze them with the kernel. They're never going to change, they're frozen. And then when the file is run, you just point the interpreter at them and, and run them while they are in flash. One problem around this is that the interpreter actually patches instructions at runtime when loading a module. So it creates these int structures and it patches things like branches. Now, when the Limbo compiler creates disk files, it, it can't know where any of these structures will be at runtime, which is why the interpreter has to patch them at runtime. But we can, we can decide where in, in flash memory they can go. So if we 
convert these or expand them ahead of time and put them in somewhere in, in flash memory, we can pre-patch these instructions. So we can solve these problems. But we're left with some practical problems. So how do we freeze, actually freeze disk files? How do we convert the bytecode into expanded code and, and, and put them um, in, in flash memory? How does the interpreter at runtime know which files are frozen and which aren't? And then how does it actually find the code for the frozen modules? It's somewhere in flash, but where is it? How does it find it? And then maybe a more mundane thing, but how do we automate this so we don't have to convert individual modules and locate them in memory and so on? So how to freeze a disk file is, is quite straightforward. There's already code to read disk files in libinterp. So we can create a, a tool to freeze this and we just borrow the code from there. And what this does is, as I've said, it expands the code, the disk code, the code from the disk file and it compiles it into the kernel into the, as a piece of data somewhere. And the question arises, what do we put in the root file system instead of the original file? That we could, but what we could do is we could put just the code section from the file in the kernel and we leave the rest in the, in the file in the root file system. But then we'd have to mess around with a different file format kind of thing. So what, what we could do instead is we could put the entire thing, the entire this file, but with expanded code in the kernel and as a piece of data somewhere. And we just leave a placeholder in the root file system that basically says this was here and this is what you should look for. And as you can see, that's what, what you do. You, you have a magic number at the start of a file and we have a, a string which says this is the file that was originally here. So which files are frozen and which are normal files? And as you've seen, we, we use a different magic number at the start of the file. And in the case of a frozen file, we use a token to, to, to identify the frozen module. So basically the loader now does something a bit different in the pass mod function. It's a normal magic number that it finds, it just runs the function as normal. But if it finds a new magic number, it executes a different function, this load frozen function, which is new and it's in a different file. So we still have to find frozen modules. What we have is a converted disk file, which is now in the kernel. Now is a piece of data somewhere. And we have some placeholder files in the root file system. So when the interpreter loads a placeholder file, it checks for the new magic number, it reads the token, it searches a linked list of structs to find the matching token and data. Then once it's found what it's looking for, it calls this other underscore load frozen function. And this does what pass mod normally does, except the code, as we know, is already unpacked somewhere and it's ready to use. So we can just point a, a, prefer a pointer to point to it. But we still have some missing pieces here. So we need to initialize this linked list of frozen modules so that there's a way of actually tracking them down. And the way we do this is we implement this add frozen mod function to register them. And this is just an, another sort of helper function that goes in this new load frozen file. So we still need to describe all the frozen modules that we're going to include when we build a kernel and we need to register them when the kernel starts. So we can do both of these at the same time. And we do this by using a feature of the configuration file or the configuration file format, where we usually have a root section for the root file system with entries that have two file names or path names. On the on the left is what the file how the file will appear in the in the root file system, and on the right is the source file was, what, which file was actually used to populate the root file system. 
And as you can see on the left, it says it's a .dis file. On the right, we're actually passing this .fdis file, which is what we saw before. It's a, a placeholder file. In the make file, we do some things. So we run a, a, a script called make frozen. And what this does is it goes through the configuration file and it finds all these .fdis entries. And it runs the freeze tool on each of the corresponding disk files. And what this does is it creates a frozen.h file with some calls in it to register modules. It has a macro which it, it adds to. And this .h file is included by this frozen.c file in its init frozen function. Also in the make file, there's a list frozen tool that gets called. And what this does is it creates a build rule for all the frozen modules. So what this means is we can scan the configuration file and we can create some kind of source file for each of the modules we want to freeze. And we're compiling a list of calls to register those at, at, at runtime. And we're also creating a build rule. So we actually compile all the frozen modules as well when we compile the rest of the kernel. So at runtime, the main function calls this init frozen function. And what that does, as I've said, is it calls add frozen mod for each frozen module. And so the interpreter ends up with a linked list of frozen modules. So when time comes to load a, a frozen module, it can load up the placeholder file, it can check the magic number, it can look up the token, and it can find the frozen module data. So to summarize this process, or look at it from a different angle, a frozen module is like a normal disk file, but it's got a different magic number, and it's got an expanded code section, and it's in flash memory somewhere. The placeholder file refers to a frozen module using a token, which is basically just the original path, just to make sure that they're all unique. The interpreter checks for the new magic number when it's loading a disk file, uses the token to, to look up the frozen module data, and it loads it differently because although a lot of it is still the same as it was originally, the, the code doesn't need to be unpacked. It, it's already unpacked in flash memory, and we can just point the interpreter to it. The build system finds frozen module declarations in the configuration file. It creates frozen module data, as I've said, and it generates code to register these frozen modules at runtime. But there are problems. So the code itself is read-only, but sometimes it's assumed that it's in memory that's been allocated. So the, the first place you encounter this is the free mod function. So when a module is finished with, it would be freed. All the sections would be deallocated. And of course, the code section is not allocated anymore. So that needs fixing, which is pretty straightforward. A more su surprising case in some respects was the dev prog file system. So the first thing that happened or well, the way that I encountered this was I ran PS to look at the process table and it crashed. And the reason for this is, well, it expects the, the code to be in RAM. And the way we get around this is we introduce a frozen flag in the module struct. This means we can check this in appropriate places and do the right thing. Another issue is that frozen modules are not really completely frozen. All the other sections are still using RAM. We, we still have type information there, we have data. Even the module name is still in RAM. And it takes time to track down users of these sections. In the beginning, I planned to put them all in Flash. And then I found that that was rather over ambitious. So I scaled it back to the original core purpose of, or core idea 
and things kind of work. So what are the benefits of doing all this? Why go through all this hassle? Well, there is a re reduced allocation overhead. One of the things is you don't need to allocate RAM now for the just to load a disk file. It's already in Flash in some form or other. I mean, an extended or expanded form, at least for the code. You can just refer to each of the data structures in Flash by their, by their addresses. And of course, there's less RAM used for instructions now because we're not expanding them into RAM. And this is especially a, a benefit for, for large modules. Of course, modules that use things like large sections of data, well, that's a different story. And there are some indirect benefits as well. So there's less RAM used for the root file system because lots of these modules are now in kind of part of the kernel. So they're never copied into, into RAM. But that really shouldn't have been in Flash anyway. So perhaps there should be some changes to the tool chain to allow this. And maybe, maybe there is a way of doing this and I haven't found it. So what's next? Well, the linker TL has a, a dash T option, which suppose it's supposed to put strings, some, some strings into the, into the text section of the kernel. And uh, I had some pro trouble with this, but in the end, I, I managed to get it to, to do, I think what it's supposed to do. And it saves a few kilobytes of RAM, which you know, it's not much. It doesn't, it's not a game changer necessarily, but every little helps. What would be better is to move more constant or immutable data into the, into the kernel or into a read-only section somewhere. And it's early days with this, this slow progress. There's a lot to understand. Another way to go about this is to use a different tool chain to build kernels. So the port of Inferno to the RP2040, as far as I can tell, uses the tool chain that's provided for that processor. And that does things a bit differently. I think it leaves more of this data as read-only data in a read-only data section. So you're not putting so much in RAM, as far as I'm aware. And something else which is not really about saving memory at all, it's just an, another logical step, is if we can move bytecode or expanded code into into flash memory, then perhaps we could also do the same about uh, for the code that would otherwise be generated by the JIT compiler. Instead of putting it in RAM, maybe we could perform some kind of ahead of time compilation and put it into flash memory. It could be expensive because we're filling up the flash memory with full instructions. And although we have a megabyte of flash memory in this case, it does run out quite quickly if you're not careful. I haven't really looked into how feasible this is. Um, and I'm sure there are some showstoppers or potential showstoppers. And as I discovered with just the regular byte code, I'm sure there are some issues around memory allocation that you need to take care of. So I'd like to say thanks to Charles Forsyth for answering my questions about the compilers, um, the ARM compilers, the MIPS compilers, the Thumb compiler. Uh, it was all very helpful and got me to understand at least a, a small part of them. Also to Michael Engel for his discussions about microcontrollers, which ones were kind of interesting to use or think about using um, when thinking about ports of Inferno. And also to the people on the Inferno OS and Nine Fans mailing lists and other forums for discussions around things and general support. And I'll refer you to to some resources. Um, there's my repository where I'm working on this particular project. 
And I also maintain a diary, which I update occasionally to note something that some things that might be interesting or some things that I've done um, either with Inferno or adjacent to it. And the point about writing that is to keep me motivated. So thank you very much for listening.